Bringing you the very latest from across the nation and around the world. This is your Primetime News Bulletin. A very good evening. I'm Shane Silver. And I'm Bernie Jai Singh. Good evening. Let's now take a look at headlines. No confidence motion against the Prime Minister to be debated on the 4th of April. Minister Kiriala says 85 members of the UNF have expressed support for the Prime Minister. President orders construction to halt at the Muthurajavila Reserve. MP Namal Rajapaksa denied entry to the United States. Transparency International cries foul over diluted national audit bill. On to your stories in detail now. The UN Human Rights Commissioner's country update on Sri Lanka was delivered at the 37th Human Rights Council session late last night. Delivering the update, UN Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights Kate Gilmore stated that Sri Lankan authorities have yet to demonstrate their willingness or the capacity to address impunity for gross violations of international human rights. I'm pleased to advise that we welcome the government's constructive engagement with the Office of the High Commissioner and Human Rights Mechanism. It was with much regret that we must also report slow progress in establishing trans transitional justice mechanisms. In the absence of concrete results or publicly available drafts of legislation, it seems highly doubtful that the transitional justice agenda committed to by the government under this Council's Resolution 30-1 will be fully implemented before our next report in March 2019. Furthermore, the authorities have yet to demonstrate the willingness or the capacity to address impunity for gross violations of international human rights and international humanitarian law. This strengthens the arguments in favour of the establishment of a specialised court to deal with serious crimes, supported by international practitioners. And in the absence of such a mechanism, we do call on member states to exercise universal jurisdiction. We are also seriously concerned about multiple incidents of intercommunal violence, attack and hate speech against minorities observed throughout last year, a worry further exacerbated by recent developments that have occurred since the drafting of this report, including violence against Muslims in Kandy district that led to a procl proclamation of a state of emergency for 12 days. The UK representative, speaking on behalf of a number of countries, including the United States, expressed confidence in the current administration's ability to deliver the reforms expected by the UNHRC. We welcome the overall improvement in human rights and democratic reforms, which the High Commissioner's update notes. Sri Lanka is safer and freer than in 2015. The government's constructive engagement with, the, with special procedures and support for the peace-building priority plan is welcome. The consultation task force issued an important report to reflect the views of Sri Lankans and recent legislation on enforced disappearance is positive. While welcoming these steps, we are disappointed that the pace of progress has been slow. Much remains to be done to implement Sri Lanka's commitments. We remain concerned about reports of abuse of authority by some security officials and multiple incidents of intercommunal violence, attacks and hate speech against minorities are alarming and demonstrate the need for reconciliation efforts. With determined leadership and a clear timeline for action, this government can deliver the reform and justice agenda and take the actions needed to support long-term reconciliation with the support of all Sri Lankans. Addressing the session, Minister of Foreign Affairs Dilak Marapana, who is leading the Sri Lankan delegation in Geneva, expressed his confidence in the capability of the Sri Lankan judiciary to fulfil the obligations made by the country to the UNHRC. We are pained by the recent incidents in a few areas of Sri Lanka targeting members of the Muslim community who represent an integral and part of the pluralistic society of Sri Lanka. Such acts which go against our shared vision of a Sri Lankan where equal rights and rule of law are guaranteed for all have no place in a democratic pluralistic society. The government has taken swift action against perpetrators of these incidents 
and is investigating any lapses that may have taken place on that occasion. Stringent measures will be initiated to ensure non-recurrence. A victim compensation program has already commenced and we have reason to believe that certain interested parties were behind this to tarnish our image at a time when this council is in session. Sri Lanka's judiciary and the law enforcement mechanisms are fully capable and committed to advancing justice to all concerned. It has a long history of integrity and professionalism. And since January of 2015, steps have been taken to further strengthen its independence. And may I add that all reconciliation mechanisms can and will be implemented in accordance with our constitution. The legacy of conflict in Sri Lanka is heavy and it permeates our society to this day. Extremists constantly strive to take advantage of the situation to achieve political gain. This realization only makes us even more determined to ensure that we never return to the violent days of the past. It is our intention to ensure the fulfillment of our commitments to all our people and bring closure to a sad and disturbing period of our recent history. The motion of no confidence against Prime Minister Rani Vikramasinghe will be debated on the 4th of April. Neil Idhavela, the Deputy Secretary General of Parliament, said this was decided at the party leaders' meeting held today. Yesterday, the MPs representing the joint opposition handed over the no-confidence motion against Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe to the Speaker. This motion contains 14 key points. 55 MPs had signed the motion. However, former President Mahinda Rajapaksa did not sign the motion. Today, the MPs who contested under the United National Front ticket convened at the parliamentary complex for a meeting with the Prime Minister. In as much uh, a vote of no-confidence has been placed on the Prime Minister, we of the United National Party must show our confidence in the Prime Minister. So we asked the, the members, we requested the members whether they would sign uh, a document uh, indicating their confidence uh, in the Prime Minister. And uh, up to now 85 signatures have been obtained and 15 of our members are, are abroad. So I think uh, without uh, any doubt we will have the required number. And uh, what is the responsive response of the TNA? TNA and the uh, and the UNP has a cordial relations always, so I don't think there would be a problem uh, about getting the support of the TNA and not only the TNA, even some upcoming Tamil parties who are not in government uh, and uh, certain Tamil parties in the north who have no association with the TNA will support us. A question has arisen within political circles as to whether State Minister Vasanta Senanayaka had signed the motion of no confidence. This was his response to the question posed by News First. I am not aware of that and I did not sign any motion of no confidence. I did not sign anything against it as well. It is completely false to claim I signed that motion. I say again, I have not signed it. Former President Mahindra Rajapaksa did not sign the no-confidence motion against the Prime Minister. Will he cast his vote against the Prime Minister? News First Digital conducted an opinion poll on this. Here are the latest results of the opinion poll. 70% of those who voted said that the former president will not vote against the Prime Minister. Only 30% of the respondents predict that the former president will cast his vote against the PM. General Secretary of the United National Freedom Front, Maitre Gunaratna, says the UNP MPs must take an open decision on the motion of no confidence. I wish to stress to the UNP MPs, stop playing hide and seek and vote for the motion of no confidence. If you do not send this leader packing, you can never revive the United National Party. You speak one thing in the village and something completely different to Parliament. Implement what you speak in the villagers. If you do not remove this Prime Minister, no one can prevent this country moving to the brink of disaster. Grassroot level members of the UNP continue to express their dismay over the leadership of the party. <laughs>
The election loss was caused by the leaders in the party and not the candidates. They promised to put people behind bars and those turned out to be false promises. Nobody was put in prison. Then they committed theft. What happened? We lost an election, which we could have won. We managed to win the municipal council because there was no competition from the flower bud. If not, we would have lost that too. The destruction was caused by the leaders in the party, including the general secretary and the chairman. I have not been able to meet with the general secretary in three years. Nandana Gunathilaka has echoed the same sentiments. I have not been able to meet with the party leader in over a year. I do not wish to see him at all. He is disgusting. I feel disgusted to even mention his name. I am not carrying anything forward in politics. I can leave at any given time. I am not afraid of the leadership as long as the people are with me. The people call for a young leadership and a new change. People like Sajid Premadasa are ageing. There is no use of people like Navin Desanayaka. People like Buddhika and Harin are being destroyed. In such a situation, if we do not address this, the United National Party will be destroyed. These remarks were made when Nandana Gunathilaka assumed duties as the new chairman of the Panadura Urban Council. The leader in the party must be held responsible for the loss. There is a leader, general secretary, treasurer, national organizer and a working committee. Just because they are collectively making decisions, I do not think those below should follow blindly. They must have held talks with the leaders in the recent past to continue with these activities. Like it or not, the end result was the loss at the local government elections. When there is a government in power, we can only win these elections and not lose them. Will he? Won't he? Here are the opinions of three UNP members. You have to raise that question with Mahindra Rajapaksa as to why he did not sign. We will do what is needed to defeat the no-confidence motion. There have been no confidence motions before. If they hand in a motion of no confidence, we have to accept that challenge. We hope to face the challenge successfully. We will be united as a party. We will not speak about things that should be spoken about within the party anywhere else. I am a person who fights the most and I am the person who has to bear the consequences. We are, however, talking about change that should be done within the party. As a policy, I do not speak of such matters before the media. Inside the party, I have spoken about the changes that need to take place without any hesitation. I am even prepared to let go of the positions I hold. While politicians in Sri Lanka are gearing up for a no-confidence motion, over in Peru, the country's president decided to step down from power when confronted with a similar motion. In his official statement, President Pedro Pablo said that he is stepping down for the good of the country. While politicians in Sri Lanka are gearing up for a no-confidence motion, over in Peru, the country's president decided to step down from power when confronted with a similar motion. In his official statement, President Pedro Pablo Kaczynski said that he is stepping down for the good of the country. President Kaczynski resigned yesterday after a secretly recorded video appeared to show his allies offering to reward opponents with public contracts in exchange for not impeaching him. Kaczynski, 79, said in a televised speech he was stepping down and had submitted his letter of resignation to Congress, ending his presidency after just 19 months. His decision comes in the wake of allegations of wrongdoing over his past business ties with a Brazilian construction firm which has acknowledged to Brazilian and US investigators having paid $800 million in bribes to obtain construction contracts in 10 Latin American countries. This includes Peru. Kuczynski denied wrongdoing in his speech, saying his resignation was for the good of the country as the current political crisis has undermined his ability to govern. President Maitapal Sirisena issued instructions today to cease all the activities of construction and landfill which are paving the way for environmental pollution around Muthuraj Vela Sanctuary. This morning, the President inspected the sanctuary. The President has ordered to revoke all the permits that have been issued by any government organization to fill any lands around the area. The President has instructed relevant authorities to take disciplinary actions against the government officers who have already sponsored such acts which pollute the environment or those who are still giving assistance for such harmful actions. Following repeated media reports on acts of environmental pollution that was occurring near the Muthura Ajavela Reserve, President Sirisena made a deep study on the issue and undertook this visit. 
President Sirisena instructed the Inspector General of Police to provide special security through the Police Special Task Force and to erect barriers on the roads leading to the wetlands in order to prevent environmentally harmful acts from taking place. Government institutions have sponsored the first wrong that was committed. These are paddy lands. Therefore, committing such an act can be viewed as wrongful because of the environmental issue that prevails. The engineer is also at fault. It appears that national resources are being destroyed for money. President Maitri Palasir Sena left for Islamabad today to attend the Pakistan Republic Day celebrations as chief guest on an invitation extended by Pakistan President Mamnoon Hussain. A release issued by the Presidential Media Unit notes that this is the first time a Sri Lankan leader received such an invitation to be the chief guest on the Republic Day of Pakistan and it reflects the strength of bilateral friendship and ties. During the trip, the President expected to hold discussions with President Mamnoon Hussain and Prime Minister Shahid Kakan Abbasi. Two countries will also discuss economic, trade and educational relations. During the President's visit. Pakistan gained independence on August 15, 1947 and became a republic on March 23, 1956. Since then, the Republic Day is celebrated as the National Day of Pakistan. Joint opposition MP Nama Rajapaksa was denied entry to an Emirates flight from Moscow to the United States earlier today. There were no clear reasons given. The MP was travelling to the States following his tenure as an independent election observer at the Russian presidential election, where Vladimir Putin won a fourth term in Russia's big seat. Foreign media reported that the MP's office issued a statement saying there is no explanation from US embassies in Moscow or Colombo on the same he had a valid visa, quote-unquote. Emirates Air Moscow informs I won't make my Houston flight as US officials instruct them not to let me on board. Valid reason yet to be received. US has the sovereign right, of course. Sure, it has nothing to do with my name being part of LK opposition or my travel from Russia. Now that is the same tweet that you see behind me. First and foremost, Nama Rajapaksa is a Sri Lankan, a Sri Lankan national. So the manner in which he was treated leaves much to be desired. Now whatever the circumstances that emerged regarding this incident, it must be remembered that Sri Lanka and Sri Lankans must be treated with dignity by all nations. It's back to the new studio and over to Shane. Thank you, Ramesh. Moving on to other local stories now. Transparency International Sri Lanka has issued a statement saying it is extremely concerned over amended provisions in the gazetted National Audit Bill. Major areas of concern. One. The surcharge powers being the power to recover monies related to any fraud, negligence, misappropriation or corruption have been vested in the chief accounting officers instead of the Auditor General. Two, vast discretionary powers have been vested in chief accountants in determining the final search. Three, persons subject to an inquiry by the Auditor General are entitled to nominate others to appear on their behalf. Transparency International Sri Lanka says that the surcharge powers being vested with the chief accounting officers highlights a potential conflict of interest. Furthermore, TISL says in the event that the CAOs themselves are subject to an inquiry, surcharging power has been vested in the president as the appointing authority. However, should the president choose to impose a surcharge, the act does not provide a right of appeal to the CAO. Additionally, the release says an individual who is the subject of an inquiry is able to nominate any other persons conversant on the subject to appear on their behalf if they are unable to appear themselves. TISL fears that this provision could be abused by those seeking to avoid accountability, especially since the refusal to appear before the Auditor General is no longer an offence, as was provided in the previous versions of the bill.
The airline services trade union has expressed their dismay over the decision made to close down four routes of the national carrier and lease three aircraft owned by Sri Lanka Airlines to Turkish Airline. In addition, a letter addressed to the chairman of Sri Lankan Airlines by four directors notes this decision had clearly violated company statutes. On the 22nd of February, the Secretary to the Prime Minister informed the Chairman of the airline that because the Sri Lankan airline's fixed cost was 21 million US dollars, the Cabinet Subcommittee on Economic Management had reached an agreement to instruct Sri Lankan Airlines to enter into negotiations and conclude terms with Turkish Airlines at the earliest possible date. However, four members of the Board of Directors in a letter to the Chairman have expressed their opposition to the decision. In the letter, they state that at the last board meeting held on the 6th of March, the CEO of the airline had questioned the matter of discussing a lease with the Turkish airline. The letter further states that the members of the board only learned of the decision to lease the aircraft via external sources. Further, it is also stated the letter from the Cabinet Subcommittee dated February 22nd was tabled at the aforementioned meeting on the 6th of March by the chairman, but it adds that the directors had no knowledge of the 21 million US dollars in fixed costs. Accordingly, as the letter elaborates, uh, the fact that the perpetrated lease of three aircrafts to Turkish Airlines is unknown to the national carrier, the Board of Directors state they are not connected to this incident and it violates the statutes of the company. As of now, the administration has shut down four routes and they are trying to lease three A330s on a wet lease to Turkish Airlines. We are opposed to this. As a trade union, we are opposed to the shutting down of any routes. Before this, they shut down three European routes and leased three aircrafts to Pakistan. That deal was a complete failure. Finally, the aircrafts became a burden on us. So we request the authorities, please stop this. And given how the airline has not been handled well, we request the president to take the airline under his wing. We request him to appoint a real chairman and a proper board of directors to manage this and to do justice by the taxpayers of the country. Sri Lankan Airlines made profits of 4.8 billion in 2008, but come 2009 they made a loss of 9.9 .9 billion rupees and continued making losses to date. In 2015 the loss was 26.8 billion rupees and it was recorded as 12 billion in 2016. And last year the recorded loss increased to 28.5 billion rupees. As per sources from within the airline, Funding from the Treasury has been used to run the airline from April this year. The newly elected mayor of Colombo, Rosie Sinanayaka, officially assumed duties today. Rosie Sinanayaka made history as the first woman to take oaths as a mayor of Colombo. Ministers, MPs, and well wishers were among those present for this occasion. <laughs> Two-thirds of those living in the Colombo municipality live in poverty. They are low-income earners and live in slums. These people have been termed as slum dwellers. We have made promises to build 50,000 houses in our 10-year program. Come 2020, the Colombo port city will be the most technological advanced city in the whole of Asia and in line with that, the Colombo municipality will be converted into a blue-green city. We are to make this a clean city that can withstand disasters. We need to show commitment. Therefore, I need the support of all councillors. British Minister of State for Asia and the Pacific, Mark Field, declared to UK Parliament on Monday that he had written to Foreign Minister Tilak Marapana, setting out the views of the UK ahead of the 37th sessions of the UN Human Rights Council. Mark Field. Parliament has stressed on the need to try to encourage the Sri Lankan diaspora in the UK to play their part, adding that improving the economy and the GSP Plus is part of that. Speaking about his meeting with Foreign Minister Marapana in Colombo last year, Mark Field said he encouraged the government to focus on four steps that the UK government believe, if implemented together, would enable conditions for stability, growth and long-term prosperity for all Sri Lankans. They are to deliver meaningful devolution through constitutional reform, to establish credible mechanism for transitional justice, to return to the rightful owners all remaining private land that is still held by the military, 
and to replace the Prevention of Terrorism Act with human rights complaint legislation. He adds he will continue to press the government of Sri Lanka to make real progress in those areas. He notes the UK's message to Sri Lanka remains resolute. We absolutely expect the government to implement in full their commitments made in good faith in the aftermath of a time of terrible conflict. As a close partner but also a candid friend, we shall continue to support and encourage the Sri Lankan government to make further and faster progress, particularly on transitional justice. Mark Field added that part of the difficulty is that national elections are looming and there is more political instability than perhaps anticipated back in 2015. You are watching your primetime news bulletin. Up next is today's illustrated news by Asanka Ladua Hetti. With that, we wrap our primetime news. I'm Bernadine Chai Singha. And I'm Shreyan Silva. Take care and good night. Up next is Montage Point.